Um, and with a couple of questions for you guys, show of hands who, oh, now you can hear me, wow, now I can hear me. Um, who here is uh, operator, systems operator? Okay, how about the users in the room? Okay. Ooh. And the rest who, of you are developers then? <laughs> I think there's a few other things in this category. Marketing. Okay. Who here uses Kubernetes already? Okay, good. Um, and who's an operator of Kubernetes? Oh, okay, good. We'll have some uh, good conversations afterwards if you want. Um, does anyone have Kubernetes in production right now? One. And you're a user or operator? Two. So you do everything. Okay, right on. All right, so. Um, I wanted to, to do this talk and to get this particular group of people up here with me because it, they have such a, there's a variety of talent and of, of jobs on here and of what they're doing with uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack. Um, and so we're gonna come at this from, from many different angles. Um, that's who we are, we're on Twitter. If you have a question that you wanna ask, I'm not sure if we'll have time for it, um, but go ahead and tweet it up there and tag us and we will either get to it here um, I'm gonna try to monitor it, or we will um, for sure get to it right afterwards, just keep the conversation going. So those are our Twitter handles. Um, write those down, and, and we're, we're the experts, and we will absolutely uh, love to keep talking to you guys. So I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves uh, pretty quickly. Why don't I start with Rob Starmer? So uh, Robert Starmer, uh, I run a small technical consulting agency. Um, we help people build environments and architect what they need to do, which includes things like Kubernetes or OpenStack or both together. Okay, Dan? I'm Dan Berg. I lead our uh, container service at IBM Bluemix, uh, focusing on delivering uh, globally wide managed uh, Kubernetes clusters. And I'm Rob Hirschfeld. I am a founder of a startup uh, that does hybrid infrastructure automation called uh, Rack N. So we specialize in helping people run infrastructures like Kubernetes and OpenStack and things like that from a platform perspective. And I always tell these guys, if they don't say enough nice things about them, I'm gonna say some nice things about them. Um, so Robert Starmer is also a certified OpenStack COA, so he's the real deal, and he's out there implementing this um, in, in his, with his clients and also teaching classes and teaching his clients how to get certified and, and how to uh, figure out um, how, to, how to run this with OpenStack and other technologies like Kubernetes. Um, Dan Berg is one of the CTOs from the cloud team from IBM. He's a distinguished engineer, and um, he's my one of my favorite container guys. So whenever I have a lot of questions about containers, I go pick his brain. And Rob Hirschfield, one of the original OpenStack guys, was on the board for many cycles um, of OpenStack. So a lot of OpenStack knowledge up here, a lot of Kubernetes knowledge up here, and these guys are doing it and they're running it. And it's really going to be really interesting to hear the type of stuff that they're that they're working on. Oh, and I'm Lisa, Lisa Marie Amphi. I'm the OpenStack ambassador for the United States. I run the 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 user group in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, world's largest OpenStack user group. We've got over 6,000 members now, so if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, come see me at a meetup near you. I've morphed it to the OpenStack and containers user group, and I've run about 12 meetups on Kubernetes. So um, follow us on meetup.com slash OpenStack. We were the first ones, so we, get to, we got to do that <laughs> title, and, um, or that URL, and you'll see a lot of stuff on containers. There's also a lot of back presentations um, that I have saved, including every single one of these folks, has been nice enough to present at the meetup, even though Robert's the only one that actually lives near me. Um, but uh, they've, they've been great and really supportive of the user groups. So uh, there's presentations and videos on there. We have a YouTube channel. Um, so lots of content if, if you don't get enough of us here. So um, I wanted to talk about this. Let's start out by talking about mainstream Kubernetes adoption, because there's a lot of lessons that we've learned from OpenStack over the years and, and what it means to be mainstream. And OpenStack is now you know, year seven, so um, pretty mature and, and out there in a lot of places. But we know the pains that, ha you know, that we know what it took for enterprises to, to adopt it. And, uh, and I, know, I know a lot of you in the room here, and I, I know you do too. So one of the questions I had, you know, in terms of lessons learned from OpenStack, um, what about Kubernetes? Is it there yet, or what is it gonna take to be enterprise ready? So it's, it's actually an interesting question, and I'll field it first, but um, 
you know, I think with OpenStack, what we saw was that initially the idea was, hey, this is only for web scale applications. We're just going to try to implement a web scale application service, and that's great. And enterprises that tried to start using it said, that's a wonderful idea for you guys to use this, but the tooling looks like it would really fit what we need for enterprise applications. I think Kubernetes is going through that exact same cycle. Initial release, web scale apps only, that's the only thing that we're going to focus on and work on. And almost immediately somebody said, well, could we like actually model what an enterprise application might look like in Kubernetes. They started implementing some of the services and, and the, the tooling that was required to start supporting applications. So the pet sets, which are now stateful sets, um, persistent volumes, a volume claim capabilities, that there was a way to provide persistence across the environments. These were two things that really sort of made enterprise readiness a part of Kubernetes thinking. It's not there yet. Right, there are still things in terms of, of roles-based access that I think are really important to a lot of enterprises to really make this a usable tool, but people are starting to try to implement it and trying to figure out what those gaps still are. But aside from the features in Kubernetes itself, like so maybe, Rob, you can talk about the services, the old things that people are going to be so building. I, no, and th this is, there's a really important point. Um, Kubernetes was built by the team that built Borg, which is uh, Google's container infrastructure scheduler. So it's, it's a second system or maybe even a third system. So the architecture within Kubernetes is, is really well baked as far as what it needs to do and how it needs to go. For those of you who had the early OpenStack journey with us, you'll know that we didn't have a lot of things baked, right? Neutron went through a lot of gyrations. Um, you know, the, the heat templates, dashboard, right? We, we, we had a lot of sort of false starts with OpenStack. And so, you know, it's important when you look at Kubernetes, you know, to think through this isn't just somebody coming up with the idea and we're going to work out some patterns. The patterns for Kubernetes are much more established, um, where in OpenStack it, it, we had to evolve a lot more. The, the other thing to keep in mind here as well is that Kubernetes is a platform that has well-defined integration points and extension points. And to make it enterprise ready, you, you as a provider of a Kubernetes system needs to implement various points, um, those extension points, using tools and capabilities of the environment that you're gonna run in. And, and many times how you implement those could add greater security, greater enterprise capabilities to an already pretty rich environment, orchestration environment of Kubernetes. Um, for example, your pers persistent storage. Different persistent storages have different capabilities built in, encryption, key management, backup and recovery. That is beyond the scope of Kubernetes, but definitely part of an overall solution that many, many providers are providing to their customer set. Okay. And who's going to be, um, let's put it this way, who's going to be the Morantis of Kubernetes using an OpenStack analogy, or is there going to be one or should there be one? I'm kind of hoping that there isn't one, that there are multiple of us that can use the same exact systems model. I mean, I think the OpenStack community had a problem with snowflakes. Everybody wanted to build a slightly different OpenStack environment, and that's great because the flexibility is there. Open source drives that concept that make it whatever you want. But in the Kubernetes world, I see a much more consistent model of deployment. People are doing the same sorts of things with the extensibility on the back end that's, that's really well hidden, right? This ability to talk to different types of persistent volumes, different types of compute nodes, uh, it, it seems to be handled slightly better in the Kubernetes environment, right? So I don't think we need a single source to say, this is the only way to do Kubernetes, uh, which is I think what we got from a lot of different vendors in the OpenStack community saying, this is the only way to go do this. Now, now to extend on that though, <laughs> it, it, I agree that Kubernetes, there, there isn't, it's less of a snowflake. Right, especially if you're going with different providers, cloud providers in the public that provide them. Um, generally, you can take one workload and move it between them, and it works fairly well. Um, it's very consistent. Um, where I find some system support coming in is that while you get the raw tools for a Kubernetes cluster, which is extremely rich, how do you configure one for multiple teams to utilize a cluster, right? How do you set up um, roles and access, going yeah, back to right. our back. How do you set up the namespaces? How do you set up the security groups between those? How do you ensure that all the different pieces, all those, all those components that are very rich in a Kubernetes environment are actually configured to fit your needs? And I think that's where a lot of education is needed, good examples, and probably a niche for some service teams. But I don't think there's going to be one, right? Right. So, yeah, I don't, I mean, there were, there were a lot of service organizations. Mirantis is the GOAT in this case. Um, because they were so good 
at being the people who were helping do deployments, doing customer service, you know, doing, you know, in there, in the field, extending the product, doing projects where people wanted to add to it. And Kubernetes, you know, I, one, I hope we don't end up with people who specialize in doing nothing but installing Kubernetes. I, we just, that's not where we want the value to be. And we definitely don't want the value to be a whole bunch of custom Kubernetes one-offs. Um, so, right, if you look at what Mirantis was able to do in the OpenStack community and, and help, it, help it grow very quickly, but in, in a less controlled way, you know, I think Kubernetes, because it's so cloud-focused, you don't need all that, right? right? You were discussing how much, you know, Kubernetes is not shy about saying, oh, I'm gonna use EBS and load balancers and all these pieces. It, you know, we're, I don't think we're there yet on the on-premises mm -hmm. private Kubernetes yet. That will probably require a lot more consulting, but I don't think it's gonna dominate the Kubernetes infrastructure. Well, I, I, I the think there's a, there's a better segregation, right? So the Kubernetes layer provides a cleaner separation between application, application interface, and then that underlying infrastructure. Yeah. So you can have different backend resources, and yes, there might be consulting needed to do a particular integration for a, a storage technology that doesn't exist, or, or a, a, you know, an RBAC tool that hasn't quite been integrated in, or uh, all the different network models that could, could exist under Kubernetes, but the end user is never going to see that. Right, the, the, the end user in OpenStack, there was a lot more flexibility, so you would potentially see differences in how the storage operated, differences in what your network could or couldn't do for you. But, right? And there, there's another thing that happened in early OpenStack days that was especially problematic, which would be that you had somebody, Sahara is a great example to me, right? Sahara was a project where, oh, I want big data on OpenStack, and it became a project. And, and Kubernetes community is very averse to lumping new big functionality pieces into the, into the community. And that's another one of the antidotes for that, that behavior where we have this, you know, people have this ground race to be the first project that does something so they can plant the flag and own it. Kubernetes is really not, is trying to make the project smaller. So the idea that you're gonna bring a big data project and make it part of Kubernetes isn't gonna, it's not gonna work. Yeah, everybody's in but, it might show up in the Cloud Native Foundation, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, where they're parking lotting things like that, but that's not competitive. Okay, and when you say GOAT, of course, you didn't mean greatest of all time, you meant GOAT, actually. I meant the, the, Yeah, the, we're in a sports <laughs> town here, and there's, we're going to the baseball oh, park yeah. tonight, so I just wanted to clarify that for you guys. Um, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, okay, so it, do you have to run this on an Amazon or an IBM Blue Mix or Azure? Uh, maybe I'll start with Dan on this one since you are running this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did I know you were going to say that? So, uh, no. I mean, it, it, there's plenty of providers that provide the automation to put and, and provision a Kubernetes into an environment. Now, depending on the provider and the tools that you use, the way in which it's managed might be different, right? Um, some are provision all the worker nodes and master nodes all in one account in one network and everything, and you, you basically manage it yourself. Versus like the system I have, we provision all the masters and manage all the masters independent of the worker nodes and the customer scales up and down the worker nodes. So there's different management styles, um, but I think fundamentally where, where this comes in is that the Kubernetes are consistent across the board, right? That abstraction layer is the same across the board. You can take a deployment into one and move it and put it into another and move it and put it into your on-prem. That's one of the hugest values of Kubernetes. Now, as far as how it runs and how it operates and how it's managed, that's where you're gonna find some distinctions. And I, I'm of the opinion that because of the, the extension points that the cloud providers have to implement, they're generally gonna have a better implementation of Kubernetes for their environment than anyone else because they own that environment. They have access to capabilities that others may not have direct access to. So that's generally gonna be the case, and I know this because that's what we're doing as well. Um, and that's gonna be true across the board, but it doesn't mean that you have to have a cloud provider in order to get a Kubernetes environment. That, there's plenty of examples where you can get one without a cloud provider. Well, I think there's an interesting capability here as well, and that is that because the Kubernetes interface is so consistent, I mean, there are, it is possible to expose differences through that interface, but yeah. because it is so consistent, it's easier to start actually realizing the, 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 the dream of the hybrid cloud, where I can pick right. from a number of different providers, including potentially my own and potentially my own multiple site sort of providers, 
to actually implement the applications and distribute them much more efficiently. In addition to the fact that the containerization of these applications potentially dramatically reduces the size of at least the, the compute element of the resource, maybe not so much the storage element, there's still a question of how you deal with that in a, in a sort of a hybrid cloud environment. You suddenly have the ability to say, well, I can deploy some workload into my local environment, some workload into a remote environment, and the models look the same. Uh, so that's, I think, incredibly powerful. At the same time, there are things like now there's the federation model that's being, being enabled in Kubernetes, and there's still a lot of work to be done there, but potentially you even get a single endpoint to say, hey, I would like to use the Kubernetes interaction model and now talk to my Bluemix and my Amazon and my local provider-based models for these things. Right? So what workloads are, are best for Kubernetes? Everything. <laughs> everything, oh my gosh, that's what he said, but that's not actually true. <laughs> I mean, who, who thinks everything should be run on Kubernetes? <laughs> Some, okay, Dan is also, yeah, it's like move it all into the cloud. Really? I'm sure we yes. can play devil's advocate here. Absolutely. What, what wouldn't you move in the cloud? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of hybrid and doing the, right, doing the right things, right? So it doesn't make sense to square peg everything into a Kubernetes round hole. Sometimes that, that type of migration is not a useful thing. So it's very helpful to have an adjacency where you could say, you know, I'm still running this Oracle database, and you know, I, I'm going to leave it running on bare metal. I'm going to leave it running in, in this infrastructure and, and attach to it, where so we can force fit things into containers and, and spend a lot of time worrying about it. Um, I'm I'm amazed at how much people are putting into containerized infrastructures. The thing that that I would say with Kubernetes is Kubernetes is an architectural pattern or requires an architectural pattern. Mm -hmm. So if your configurations aren't designed for that and you can't handle, you don't have the durability to handle immutable infrastructure, you can't handle stateless type of applications where your, your worker can just die and be restarted somewhere else, there's a lot of places where it's much harder to make that jump um, and probably not worth as much. Well, and, that, and that's a really great point because, so trying to move everything like everything you want to move, a lot of people get that, it's containerization, so I'm gonna move everything because it's gonna save a lot of money and I'm gonna do it all at once. That never works, that always fails. You hear that every uh, three years? Oh my gosh, <laughs> every other day. Um, so I, I actually manage the Watson workloads at IBM as well on top of Kubernetes. Now, not all of them are over there yet. Um, they have an infrastructure that they started with before, um, a lot of it VM-based. It's not gonna all move from day one, but basically we've set up a, we want to preserve a Kubernetes environment. So as they move into Kubernetes, I want it to be a native Kubernetes experience. Use all the capabilities of Kubernetes, but we integrate, we built adapters to integrate into their existing environments so that they have, a, like for example, microservices, they have a service discovery that lives outside of the Kubernetes cluster that allows you to, and we synchronize the services between what's in the cluster and what's outside of the cluster so we get a global view. But they still have things running on bare metal and VMs, but it's one environment for them, and they can naturally move things into Kubernetes as they learn more, and they re-architect some of their apps. Well, there's, the, there's the services yeah. capability within Kubernetes that even lets you sort of simplify that process of dealing with non-Kubernetes workloads That's and exactly Kubernetes workloads, yep. and leveraging that service model to say, well, look, you can discover from, from your Kubernetes environment which is often sort of more the front end aspect of your systems, I think, today. Uh, you can discover all those static back end resources or those mm -hmm. resources that have not yet been mo moved entirely into the Kubernetes world so that your applications don't have to change their model, to, to Rob's point, right? You, you don't have to change the paradigm of how you use Kubernetes to get still access to those more static, uh, more enterprise-y, uh, slower to migrate into, into containerization yep. workloads. So one, one thing I would say, if you want candidates that are good maps for Kubernetes, look for things that you're doing a CI CD pipeline for, right? So it's a really nice map. If you're looking for, hey, th you know, should I put this in Kubernetes or not? If you can build a CI CD pipeline for it, more than likely it's gonna flow into a Kubernetes infrastructure pretty well. And if you're doing, you know, run book style automation with monthly, you know, or quarterly updates, it's automation. not a Kubernetes app. So, you know, think about this is, Kubernetes is a, is a deployment platform Look at your overall system and, and look at your, you know, how pipelines are being built, and that's where you're, gonna, you're really going to get a benefit from it. And a lot of this stuff is, is still pretty new. We've seen you know, some storage issues, but they've come a long way. We've seen um, a lot of the technology come a long way with Kubernetes. But can you talk to us about security? Because I've just been hearing this a oh, lot in these sessions, and so there, I know you think about this a lot. There's a ton of FUD about container versus VM security and things like that, and it's an, it's an evolving topic. Um, but 
if you really look at what people are doing with containers and pipelining and the fact that you don't allow access into containers and the attack surface for containers is really small, there's very strong arguments for containers right up front being more a more secure way to deploy your code than virtual machines. Because you can deploy containers without having SSH access, without giving people access to the hosts. You can't do that easily with virtual machines. It's much harder to manage a virtual machine configuration system without something like SSH access, which is a huge front door for people. That said, I think it's gonna get even better for containers as we see things like uh, dynamic scanning of containers, pre-deployment pre scanning, we're seeing some sidecar networking topologies that monitor networking actively, we're seeing uh, consolidated logging and performance tracking so that you can do a lot more proactive security based on containers as part of a, a broader posture. But the, the level of activity we see around inherently secure infrastructure um, is really high, and so it's super exciting about what's going well, I, on I with this. I think one of the things is that you know the, the underlying container operating environment does actually have some visibility into the container environment to a certain extent, yeah. and so unlike a virtual machine environment where the virtual machine really is completely segregated from the underlying operating system, if I wanted to do monitoring of everything, including potentially getting some understanding of what the applications might be doing, I don't have access to that in a virtual machine environment unless I do something specific on a VM by VM basis. So you potentially have some better visibility from a security perspective of doing what's going on, okay. too. And you're running this for your customers, so you must feel it's secure yeah, enough. Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of this comes down to a level of trust. So you get into areas as far as setting up the clusters with dedicated resources, isolations. You have to prove out from a, from a provider standpoint, we have to show and demonstrate where the levels of isolation are and where, where there are sharing and then where there's quality of services between what is shared and what is not shared. Um, and even going beyond this, I mean, containerization, uh, modern containerization, because we've had, containerization is not new. I mean, the mainframes have been doing process isolation for years and years and years and years, and that is a highly secure environment. Actually, we're bringing more of the mainframe to like Docker containers together, which is kind of weird, um, a weird way to think about it, but it's providing a very secure platform for running containers. Um, and, and what we're seeing from a provider point of view is more of that. So you're getting signed images, you're getting trusted um, content, you're getting uh, trusted platforms now um, so that as you build images and you get them signed, you are assured that when they run on a platform, a trusted platform, there's no tampering of either the image, the container, or the hardware that it runs on. So as, as more of this is coming out, it's our belief, and we're hopefully, this is true, Customers are going to get more comfortable with the fact that, okay, this is more secure than I can do on my own infrastructure, right? Because it, it can be in an extremely secure environment. Well, and there is also the model of saying we can actually deploy the entire Kubernetes environment on top of virtual machines as well. So you can get, yeah. if you need virtual machine security, if that's, a, if that's a requirement of your security group because they're just not ready to consume the knowledge around containers yet, you can still leverage this technology. You could use OpenStack to deploy your containers and then deploy Kubernetes on top of that and then you know, have a, a running workload. I mean, yeah, you could do this, all these sorts of things. Is this the best way? Let's talk about this for a second <laughs> before you just put all these ideas in, in folks' heads because, and by the way, it's working if you have questions. I, I'm seeing some things coming, or I'm seeing your comments, actually. Um, but I can see them. So if you have questions, especially about security, these are the experts. We saved the best <laughs> for last. Um, but let's talk for a second about the, the technology here um, and how exactly to build this. And one of my favorite series of meetups was when uh, we had Robert come in and talk about you know, Kubernetes on OpenStack, and then Robert Hirschfeld came in two weeks later and talked about Kubernetes as the underlay on OpenStack. And then Starmer came back and did a hands-on workshop, and we were just really confusing everybody. Um, and so we can sit up here and argue about the best way, but let's just, you know, kind of for big picture, what's the best way to run it? Because is, should we really be running this on VMs? So I think that there is a benefit to, especially for, for an operation, from an operations perspective, if you don't already have the skill set to operate a Kubernetes environment, which means that you don't necessarily have the skill set of operating the underlying infrastructure, I don't know how you're operating anything at that point. But if you, if you don't feel confident with that, but you have somebody who's going to either provide you an OpenStack system and operate the entire resource there, and yet you want to now add Kubernetes on top, I think do, doing Kubernetes from the OpenStack perspective, deploying it on top is a, is a very viable solution. You can also use tools like Ironic to deploy onto bare metal. So if you, if you still want bare metal performance, the, you know, what, 
1% or whatever performance gain you get out of that, you can do that as well. So there's absolutely a clean model for OpenStack deploying these resources and deploying these systems models. Um, that's actually what a lot of the customers that I'm talking to are doing because they're already down the path with OpenStack. That's a tool that they've already implemented. So they don't see the value in deploying Kubernetes and then deploying OpenStack on top. But that's not the only answer, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Rob has a different yeah, answer. <laughs> very, very much. Yeah, I mean, so from my, my, if you're serious about doing Kubernetes and you're building a big cluster, adding a layer like OpenStack under it is, it, you're just adding complexity and, and more things to manage and go wrong. So if, you know, if, you're, if you're building big Kubernetes infrastructures, just do it on, you know, doing it on the metal makes a lot of sense. And then you can actually buy machines that are targeted to Kubernetes, which could be smaller, have, you know, different networking topologies, less RAM, a lot cheaper. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of options for how you can do that. Um, and I think the Kubernetes on OpenStack is really compelling. Um, you know, we're seeing tremendous progress on it. It might be an operational pattern that the community can get behind and finally get upgrades and HA deployments sort of de facto standards, so I, I think that that is, I see that as very compelling. Um, but there, when you look at the networking complexity and SDNs on top of SDNs and stuff like that, it, there is no value. Right. I, I would, so I would take it one step further even. So I agree with you. Keep the, keep the architecture thin, yeah. um, very thin. Run it directly on the bare metal itself or the, the hypervisor provided by the cloud provider. Don't, don't try to interject another layer of um, uh, I would say virtualization at this point. Also with the networking, we use Calico for that because it's not even an overlay, it's just IP assignment. So it's very thin, very, very fast um, networking support. But I would go even one step further from what Rob's doing, um, which is what we're doing with IBM Bluemix, and then we manage Kubernetes with Kubernetes. Because at the end of the day, what we realized is that um, we were building an infrastructure and a management layer um, homegrown or using various automation tools, and then we realized, oh my gosh, we're rebuilding Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a lifecycle management tool. We thought, okay, scrap all that, ground up, it's a Kubernetes on Kubernetes model. It's actually a Kubernetes on Kubernetes on Kubernetes model. It's a triple because we have to do a global model, global rollout, so we actually have a so, couple different I'm, layers. I'm going to caution you. Look, I, I, if, I still think I still it's not, it's not a layer cake. It's, it's if horizontal. You're, if you're a Kubernetes hosting company and you're hosting multiple Kubernetes deployments, do that. But yes. if you're just trying to run a Kubernetes cluster, oh, yeah. the, the Kube on Kube stuff is, is this is way it's not more for the than there's, but there's, it's not for yeah, the and there's, there's another piece of this puzzle, right? Because we talk about Kubernetes as if it's like, oh, I've got my bare metal and I got Kubernetes on it. There still is that, how do I get from bare metal to enough of an operating system so that I can enable yeah. Kubernetes? So how do I get a core yeah. OS or CentOS or atomic base that I can then deploy a Kubernetes into? And I mean, there are tools like, like yeah, your provision provide, tool yeah. that's actually really powerful for doing that. Uh, you could leverage the OpenStack environment. And this is why I say OpenStack managing Kubernetes has some interesting potential benefits. If you already have that environment, using Ironic or the stripped down version called Bifrost, you could also use that as a way of getting the bare metal infrastructure deployed. Right, but but you, you still have to get that first hurdle deployed, yes. right, before right. you can so actually this start is, This is where I talk a lot about under underlay automation and what Rebar does and, and right. being able to reboot machines and re-image them and set right. up, right? So there's no magic pixie dust, right? Kubernetes is not going to make your servers easier to manage. Right. It will make your apps easier to manage, yeah. but you still have to have an SRE function or yeah. an ops function that's gonna manage and run the Kubernetes cluster and monitor it and do performance logging and all of those things, right? That, there's no free lunch. If you are running your own infrastructure, you are managing the hardware. Right. But there is, get, there is something up. to be, so Kubernetes is an abstraction layer for your application to run your applications. And, and when we provision clusters for customers, we tell them to keep it simple. While you could do network segmentation at the underlay, don't do it. Keep it simple. Keep your infrastructure as simple as possible, as homogeneous as possible, because it just becomes a pool for the Kubernetes cluster. Put the network segmentation in the Kubernetes cluster. That way it's portable. That way you can move it from one to another 
provider and have the same experience. I think you can take that exact same model and apply it to OpenStack. So if you still, if you can't go 100% container in your environment, so if you're building a data center and you say, well, I still need to support bare metal workloads and virtual machine workloads, and I still want containerization, I think there's no question, if you're going to do container workloads, you need to use Kubernetes. It, it is the tool to help make that easy. It provides a, a model for the pattern for how you build your applications that is really important. At the same time, if you're dealing with virtual machines, there's no way that you want to then have to build yet another infrastructure just to support virtual machines and yes. another infrastructure just to support bare metal. So from the SRE worldview, you, know, you really want one set of tools that can enable all those different pieces. And right now, I still think that OpenStack is the only tool that provides at least the bare metal and virtual machine-like functions. And, and we can then get into all kinds of fun arguments about whether or not you then use that to deploy your Kubernetes, or you do have a side-by-side -side environment uh, for containerization versus those bare metal resources. But I think there's something that still has to exist there as well. So I'm going to sneak one more question in here before we open it up to you guys. Um, and because uh, I realize I think we're keeping you from beers, maybe, really? or something maybe, like yeah. that. Um, and if I read one of your questions, maybe we'll buy you a beer. Um, but my question is, um, is Kubernetes going to have to absorb adjacent technologies the way that OpenStack has? And for those of you that are maybe new to OpenStack because you came just for the Kubernetes day, in the early days of OpenStack especially, there was requirements to be you know, OpenStack powered by to get the certifications. And it's, you, you, know, you needed Nova, you needed Neutron, you needed some of the core pieces of OpenStack to really say you know, you're running OpenStack. Um, and that actually was a requirement. But uh, Kubernetes, the CNCF, has done a pretty good job of decoupling these things, right, so that that's not a requirement. Is, is that pluses and minuses? Is it going to benefit from that? I'll say I think it's a huge benefit to keep this simple, to keep Kubernetes, I wouldn't say clean, but to keep it simple. Right? It provides a simple set of interfaces that are totally extensible. I mean, if you need to extend it, if you need to do something that's outside of what the current core Kubernetes can do, you can enable that. I, I say, I actually even said this in the OpenStack days, it's always dangerous to extend beyond what the community as a whole is looking to support because it means that you've taken yourself out of the easy integration into other providers' resources. Right? As soon as you have something that's custom in your environment that doesn't fit the normal models, you've broken it. Right? And in a sense, by saying, look, Kubernetes has this sort of capability, if you want monitoring, it's not a Kubernetes function, but there is this monitoring tool that might be useful. Right? Prometheus is one way of monitoring Kubernetes. There's a lot of work going on between those two communities to make it nicely coupled, but you don't have to use it. Right? You can still use Sensu, you can use uh, Xenos, you can use all these other tools as well to do the monitoring of your infrastructure if you've already invested in that. Right? And so it doesn't break the model to say, well, I'm going to do this differently. Um, so I think that's, that to me is the benefit of, of keeping them somewhat separate. Well, and I, and I completely agree with you. I mean, this, this helps Kubernetes to keep the abstraction layer really clean. I think they've done a really nice job of that um, from a community standpoint. Keep that clean, because then you can change out the network provider, and from a programming model point of view, you don't notice the difference. Right? It, it just, you might have underlying functionality that's a little bit different, how it interacts with the IaaS, but from an application point of view, it operates exactly the same way, right? Um, so I, I don't envision Kubernetes as a project forcing you to use various other components as part of that over, overall project, consuming more and more. Great, great example, we're working on a project um, with Google um, and Lyft actually called Istio. It's a microservices fabric. We have no intentions of actually bringing this into the Kubernetes project itself. We want to keep it separate. It will work with Kubernetes and integrate quite well with Kubernetes, but it's not being pulled into the overall project to bloat it. We want to keep that simple. Okay. Yeah. What about like Container D and some of the technologies that are probably going to come in and be required? So those, those are all pluggable. So yep. Kubernetes, there will be no big tent Kubernetes right. thing, right? <laughs> it's the, Especially the, 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 uh, <laughs> the the project the project has it actually getting skinnier. So Container D, they, it's pluggable, it's designed, right? So they're actually cutting things out so that they can change Container D for Rocket. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the storage backends. It's, those are becoming API interfaces. Yeah. The project really wants to keep itself skinny and small and focused on some APIs. And so it's, it's actually an anti-pattern in Kubernetes. Now, the thing that drove OpenStack to have all these side projects where they were trying to create load balancers service and databases service and all these Amazon equivalencies, Kubernetes just says run a Helm chart, 
right, which is the equivalent to heat in, in Kubernetes, if you want that service. And so it's perfectly reasonable to spin up an adjacency, there's a broker model, there's all these ways that you can add these missing, air quotes, missing services around Kubernetes. But the layer itself, um, especially because of, of Google's Borg model, the layer itself is this is a base service and then things get added on top of it. Another great example is like Deus, um, or all the like OpenShift or all these platform as a service things that are being built on top of it. There is no desire to include those in Kubernetes and then break the ecosystem. Right. So we will see a much healthier ecosystem in Kubernetes where people aren't fighting to be the Kubernetes PaaS. Well, this, this is why you see so many vendors as well. There are lots of third party vendors that are clamoring around this ecosystem because it's very friendly to adding content on top because they're not looking to absorb and take over. They want to promote usage in the clusters itself. Yeah. Here, here's how we would do database in Kubernetes. It's one model and you can use our tools to help you make that happen sort of exactly. thing, right? Yep. Yeah, so I think, um, are we, someone's supposed We're to be like holding over. a sign? We're a little so, over. So, all right, so then I maybe see, we'll I just see a sort question of, though. So okay, long. so the, the thought will leave you with um, one of the things I think Dan was saying earlier about, I think Mark Collier mentioned it this morning too in his keynote, um, the not invented here, you know, people trying to roll their own. Um, don't do that for now. Kubernetes is pretty good. We all sort of agree and we don't think, I mean, we haven't seen examples of someone who tried to build it themselves that was going to build anything better yet. So avoid that temptation, same thing Mark Another was saying. Another couple years. Yeah, <laughs> couple years. Um, but anyway, that's just kind of one of our, our final thoughts. So we're gonna be here for a few minutes if you wanna come and, and ask us some questions or just you know take selfies with us or whatever. Um, and otherwise, we'll, we'll see you at the event. Who's coming to the Fenway Park tonight? Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, well we can finish the conversation there and on Twitter. Thank you guys, thank, thank you. you.